Hello, everyone. I'm Francis Crosby. I'm known as Fanny and Franny, and later in my life, I was Aunt Fanny. Well, I was born in the mid 1800s in Brewster, New York. I died in my 90s in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And from age eight until age 15, I lived in Ridgefield. And Ridgefield, oh, so many wonderful things and memories happened here while I was living with the Holly family. Now, what is my claim to fame? Well, I guess you'd say it started with being blind at birth. Uh, but because I was blind, that didn't keep me from doing anything. I became a world-renowned poet, wrote thousands of poems, four books of poetry. After that, I took my words and I turned them into hymns. I wrote more hymns than anyone else, over 9,000 hymns. A hundred million published pieces of music were sold throughout the world. Also, I found I could be a spokesperson for many groups, particularly the handicapped and disabled. But myself, what was I most proud of? I was most proud of my work as what I consider a missionary in New York City and Bridgeport. Started out with very humble beginnings. My mother and father were really quite poor. And that's surprising because my mother, her family came over on the Mayflower. She was a strong DAR person. I wrote the music for the DAR in Connecticut. Also, founding family of Harvard University. On my father's side, Enoch Crosby, the very famous American Revolution spy. A lot of ministers, musical people, later on, Bing and Bob Crosby even, came from a very prestigious family lineage. Well, my life started out a little bit difficult. When I was six months old, my dad died and we were even more destitute. And also when I was six months old, they discovered, yes, I was totally blind. They tried to apply poultices and did different things. And I think they even made it worse from what I've heard. The optic nerve was ruined. How did I feel about being blind? I never knew any other way. I saw with sound and music and words and motion and, and movement. I also found that being blind, I was given an amazing education. And because I was blind and talented, people listened to me that might not have listened to me otherwise. Well, after my father died, we moved in with relatives in North Salem. And then we moved, as I said, when I was between seven and eight years old to Ridgefield to live with Mrs. Holly. Oh, she was a strong Puritan lady. She read the Bible all day long. And she said to me, she said, Fanny, I want you to memorize the Bible. I know you can do it. I did. By the time I left Ridgefield, I had memorized the Bible. Now you can imagine how that helped me write him. She also took me to church and she heard me sing and she saw I had this amazing voice. So she got me a music teacher. We worked on my voice, but I also learned to play the piano, the organ, the harp, the guitar. Oh, I just loved music so much. I love living with her. She encouraged me to write poetry. Because of her, I po published my first poem at age eight. It was fun living at her house. There were all kind of kids, and she had pets, and I had this little pet lamb. Well, I couldn't figure out what happened to my pet lamb. It had been cooked and eaten for dinner, and I turned off on animals. No more pets. 
I turned to flowers and I learned to love and worship the flowers. And I wrote the first America cantata, King of the Flowers, a beautiful story about a hermit. And this hermit, he didn't have anything to do with anyone. And then one day he heard the flowers calling to him and said, we want to have a contest. We will tell you what is so special about each one of us. And he listened and he chose the rose. And after that, he became a gardener and he invited people to his garden. Oh, life was so good after that for him. Mrs. Holly, she also got me into the prestigious New York Institute for the Blind on a full scholarship. Four years I went there in high school. Then four years of college, two years of graduate school, and forever I taught there as a teacher. Well, when I was teaching there, one of my students was Alex Van Elsine. Well, he caught my heart. He was my same age, even though I was his teacher. He was a great musician, very handsome. We married after he graduated. We had a beautiful daughter, Frances. Oh, she was born sighted, but died of crib death shortly afterwards. This took a terrible, terrible toll on our marriage, and we were never, ever close after that. Well, while I was teaching at this wonderful school, I started speaking. I found I had such power in what I had to say. I was the first woman ever to speak before Congress advocating for rights for the disabled. Oh, did people listen to me? When I spoke, I read my poetry. I also sang. I was asked to speak all over the country. I befriended seven different presidents. I wrote poetry the way Maya Angelou did when these presidents passed. Oh, I could not believe the people that I met in my lifetime. I also advocated civil rights. I was an abolitionist. I loved Lincoln. I was for temperance. I was against alcohol. I was for civil rights. I was for women's rights. I was a blind activist who never stopped. Along with this, four volumes of poetry. One of the first poems I published was published by P.T. Barnum. My most famous book was The Blind Woman Writes Poetry. Oh, I love to write poetry. I could express myself so well. I also wrote books. And then I decided why not take my poetry, my use of words, and turn it into hymns. I had musical talent as well. Oh my goodness, 9,000 hymns, thousands and hundreds and millions sheet music all over the world. Oh, blessed assurance, bright horizons, praise me, O oh Lord, in the arms of my Savior. Take me beyond you for the grace of God. There were just so many, and I didn't just write hymns. I also wrote patriotic songs. I wrote political songs, the Mexican War, the Irish potato famine, the Civil War. I wrote holiday songs. Oh, music was my way of communicating. I didn't always write the actual music, but I was there for the lyrics. I wrote so many lyrics. They gave me pseudonyms because there were just too many of my songs in one hymnal. 
I wrote with Sankey. I wrote with Root. I wrote with Kingstead. I wrote with so many wonderful people. And I became the queen of gospel hymns. What was my writing style? Oh, I worked endlessly. I would write seven, eight of these hymns a day. I would finish three or four a day, send them to the publisher. They never questioned them because they knew they would sell. How much did I get for every poem, every hymn? A dollar, two dollars. I didn't know anything about royalty, copyrights. Oh my God, I would have been a billionaire today with all of the writing I did, but that's okay. I would have given it back to the people in the missions. Yes, I was proud of the hymns that I wrote. And on my 81st birthday, they had Fanny Day and most of the Methodist churches. They sang nothing but my songs and paid tribute to me. This still continues in many of the churches today. Along with my speaking, along with my poetry writing and writing of books, along with writing so many hymns, I sometimes felt empty. I know this doesn't seem right, but I did. And I sat back in my late 50s and 60s and said, what did God want me to do? What was my mission in life? And I said, that's it, to be a missionary, to use my skills to help others. And this is what I did. I went to the Bowery. I went to Tenderloin. I went to all of these places like Skid Row. I lived with the people and I ministered to them. I ministered to the prostitutes, the alcoholics, the drug addicts, the mentally ill, the homeless, the deranged, the helpless. I took them to my bosom. I talked to them. I read them my poetry. I wrote poetry with them. I brought them together in song and taught them the word of God. Oh my goodness. I became Aunt Fanny. I became the Mother Teresa of the Lower East End of New York. This is what brought me such joy. There was even an Aunt Fanny mission named after me. And in Bridgeport, there was an Aunt Fanny homeless men's home that was named after me as well. When this happened, I knew I had done what God had meant me to do. Much later in life, I was voted in to the Hall of Fame for gospel hymns. I wasn't around for it, but I think that's a really great tribute. And I'd like you to remember three things from my talk today. First of us, all of us are born with handicaps. Some are more obvious than others. But what we have to realize is that with our handicaps, our great strengths, we need to locate these strengths and build on them. And that's what I did. The second thing I want you to remember is that, yes, you build on your strengths and you use them, but your passion in life might be different. My strengths were writing and music. My passion in my heart was ministry. And I use my strengths to fuel my passion. And that's what is so important. And thirdly, I want you to understand that sometimes you get recognition and sometimes you don't. The only recognition you need is from above, from the good Lord, and from what's in your own heart. Sixty years after I went before Congress on numerous occasions to talk 
about people who are disabled in their needs, Helen Keller came along. And she is usually the person who is attributed with speaking up for the first time about rights for the handicapped. That's okay. They needed both of us. Coming from Ridgefield, who is the composer of note that everyone looks to? It's Stephen Schwartz. He wrote all of these amazing Broadway musicals. Do people remember a great composer from Ridgefield, Fanny Crosby? No, but that's okay. But that's why today I want you to hear my story. Because when you are ahead of the curve, ahead of your time, very often people did not hear about you and now need to see that things started, especially for women, much sooner than we thought. Thank you for listening to me. Next week, I'm gonna be talking about another great strong woman in the art, Geraldine Farrar. For the first 40 years of her life, she was an internationally known opera phenomena. For the next 40 years in her life, she was probably one of the most humanitarian people that has ever lived in Ridgefield. Thank you.